All right, so uh, welcome everyone to the uh, One World Mind Seminar. Uh, our speaker today is gonna be um, Dr. Yi Ma. Uh, he's a full professor in the Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science at UC Berkeley. Uh, he is also a fellow of SIAM, ACM, and IEEE, and uh, a widely respected and highly influential researcher in data science, mathematical data science, signal processing, optimization, and machine learning uh, writ large, highly prolific, and I'm really excited to have him today to tell us uh, about deep convolutional networks from first principles. So I'll turn things over to you. Hi, th thanks, Mark, uh, for the nice introduction, and also, uh, yeah, thanks for having me for the seminar. And I, it's actually, this is really like, uh, you know, sort of a home base uh, folks here. I saw the list of speakers and organizers. Um, so today I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, deep networks. This is sort of on everybody's mind in the past, you know, probably a few years. Um, and uh, sort of I were talking about it on the bright side of the pandemic, right? So uh, I have been also been uh, uh, interested in this. Uh, in fact, if you don't even know, I mean, the, the residual network guys, actually the whole team actually from my former uh, uh, team at the Microsoft Research Asia, uh, Kai Minghe and also Sun Jian. So for a while, we have been using this for computer vision and so on applications. It's been very successful. But then the question is, you know, um, ever since it came up, came around, I, I sort of set up a task. We need to understand what's, what, what's going on with this. Um, and from a more principled point of view, right? So for a while, we just basically been dragged along by the phenomena, right? Practitioner tells us this and that, uh, the streaks and also the other phenomena, and it gets excited. And we try to, uh, everybody, you know, on the theoretical side, try to explain what's going on, what is plausible, what is feasible. And um, I also, you know, has been working on that, both using it and also to try to explain parts of the networks and uh, the phenomena. And since the pandemic, and uh, I start to realize, and we're sort of chasing tails, right? Um, we try to explain one thing at a time. This seems really the deep network as a big elephant. Everybody seems to touch one piece of it. Um, I sort of, you know, uh, give myself a little bit, uh, you know, a, a assignment to the, since the early of the pandemic. Since, since we have a bulk of time, can we just get, get back to the drawing board and try to understand things from very, very fundamental basic? Um, perspective. So uh, today I'll give a little bit of overview of what we have found during this journey uh, since uh, you know in the year and a half uh, time frame. This is joint work with my you know students and the postdocs Chong Yu at, um, at uh, Google Research and also John Wright uh, at Columbia. So when we try to understand deep networks, right? Um, I stopped taking the, the, the deep network as it is. Right, so it's a, can we just get back to the origin of data science or uh, pattern recognition, right? What learning is trying to do, right? And also, of course, uh, the most basic problems in learning, supervised and unsupervised, you know, classification clustering. Um, and even, even they are not actually fundamental. You start asking questions, why do we want to classify? Why do we want to cluster it? What do we gain from it, right? One perspective I'll give you a little bit of, you know, so, uh, we went through that a few years ago, 15 years ago, right? Turns out the more fundamental view of the reason we process data we, uh, the way we want is actually for purpose. That purpose is compression, right? And hence this actually, since we start to realize there might be a connection between the, 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 the ultimate goal of learning and also deep learning, it starts they start to become a little bit uh, apparent and also reasonable, right? So we'll introduce, turns out there is actually a very, very, uh, objective and a fundamental uh, measure that we call the rate reduction that is associated with the, from information theoretical point of view. And actually, that is actually a, a, the objective that we really want to achieve. And it turns out that the deeper networks is just a means to the end, right? It's not the purpose. It's not the, the some object you have to study. It's actually a means to an end. We'll make that clear uh, later. And this actually leads to a lot of very open give us very, very different views, open problems, especially mathematical problems, things we have never understood before. Uh, Yi, can I interrupt for a second? It seems like your, your mic is creating some static. Um, if uh, if um, it's possible to, to change something about how you're typing you in your audio. My, uh, hello, is this better? Or let me just try to uh, get to my, connect to my,
AirPod probably is better. Uh, is it's, this better? Can you hear me? It sounds a little bit better now. Uh, yeah. Yep. Sorry to interrupt, by the way. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah, good. Yeah. Thanks for letting me know. Uh, I'm just trying. Is this better? So this is, uh, yeah. Yes, I think so. I uh, just interrupt me whenever, yeah, things are. And also that, uh, so let's get back to the basics of data science or, you know, signal problem, whatever we do with data, right? Um, forget about all the different names, right? I'm, I'm kind of sick about all the names. Uh, so there's a joke, right? This is April 1st, right? So I have a joke, right? So we saw the mathematics is the art of giving the same name to different things, right? I'm sort of a joke. Machine learning is the art of giving different names to the same thing, right? So that's, you know. Um, so anyway, so what do we want to do with data? Um, so we so we, a clustering classification. We assume our data lying on some as a multi-model structures, and each class may be lying on the low-dimensional manifolds, nonlinear, and so on, right? And really, that uh, to the very bare bone, right? What we want to do is data. First, we interpolate, right? I have data points. I want to decide which two points belong to the same line, the same low-dimensional structure. They're they're nearby. They're similar, right? That's it. So that we can interpolate. Once we understand, you know, who are neighbors, who are the 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 the, 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 the sim similar data, then we become a little bit bold, right? We can try to extrapolate. If a new data point comes in, we try to decide which group it belongs to, which is the substructure it belongs to. That's about it. We call it extrapolation. Finally, of course, we don't want to just keep the way the data they are, but they are. We want to make, make them simple, right? Simple for us, simple for nature, right? So we want to change, deform the data. Uh, make the curve a linear, right? So we allow us to find a better representation, right? Then we can ask some more, right? Make the representation more compact with a parametric model or make them more discriminative, right? So when deep learning comes along, it's actually um, set of, you know, let's just lump everything together, right? So uh, from the data all the way to the label, right? So we start to forgot to talk about what we actually want to do with the data. We just want to fit the label. It has seen actually tremendous success, and we'll see why. Um, the reason, of course, uh, once you leave that, then you actually minimize the objective, right? The very popular one is cross entropy, right? I want my predictor of my network, right, function to predict the label y as the best as I can, right? This is the very body use this. But there's an elephant in the room, right? Actually, things not, do not work that, as well as people actually believe, especially if you're serious, right? And um, turns out that the, the, if you choose a network improperly, you actually can't fit anything. Actually, the arbitrary change the label and so on. It's very, very overfitting. And also, even if you are done with the training, right? You don't really know what's going on. Um, uh, uh, what's inside, right? The geometric statistical meaning about those nodes. Uh, I can tell you, I'm a computer from computer vision, right? The best people can visualize neural network still one node at a time, right? Given that you have gazillions of nodes, right? How far we're going to do to, to, a way to understand what to actually have learned with those such a network? Uh, by the way, it turns out even in the computer vision, right? We actually realize if you test the highly trained model neural networks, actually they are not as a claim, right? They are not actually robust. Actually, they are not environment even, right? With a small deformation, actually the, the prediction can be very very different. We know that, but it's something we don't talk about very much. They're actually, of course, attempt to try to understand deep networks, right? People from an information theoretical point of view, the, the, what the network might be doing, maybe it's maximize some mutual information between the label and feature, and also minimize the ones with the data, get away, uh, get, get away with all the irrelevant ones, right? This is, there's some framework has been proposed, but there's actually, a, from a mathematical point of view, actually there's a bigger elephant I wanted to point out, right? We don't talk about it, right? But it's actually a bigger elephant. All the theoretical formulation, information theoretical formulation, right? Entropy, we talk about entropy, uh, mutual information, Kell divergence, distance to maximum likelihood. There's a big problem. Why? Whenever we're dealing with data in high dimension, the distribution becomes singular or degenerate, which is commonplace. It's, it's, it's all the case, okay? Not only the dimension is high, computing those entity, evaluating them, actually there's a curse of dimension. Let alone, actually many of them actually is not well defined. To degenerate distribution, what is distance? Right, it's not defined. Curl divergence is not defined, and that's why people actually relax, right, or approximate with with Earth moving, you know, a vast time distance and so on and so forth. But once you start doing that, you really don't know what in the end the theory can guarantee. 
we actually realized this problem about 15, 20 years ago when we're dealing with clustering, you know, we're doing image segmentation, dealing with high dimensional data, so image data. We realized low dimensionality is an issue. We have to take uh, take the, the low dimensionality of the data head up. We cannot beat in the bushes, right? We cannot pretend that we can write down all this, you know, information theory, the quantity, and pretend they exist, pretend that they're they are well defined for you, right? So actually, this is some work we did. We just for the even for the mixture of subspace, let alone submanifolds, you have to do that. You know, this is sort of the work we did with how to generalize, you know, the 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 the, the data analysis to. So one thing we found out to both consistent to the classical theory as well as to, 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 to generalize to this with degenerate data, degenerate uh, low dimensional structure, you have to take the point of view of compression, right? Give a, I'll quickly do a background because this is related to what we're going to do. Um, um, so in general, we assume our data from a cloud, you know, mixture of distribution, Gaussian, whatever, all right? So of course, the, the, the first thing we do clustering, we try to find which data points should be to go together, right? And um, we write a mixture of distribution, we pretend those probability exist, and we know we parameterize them, we start to do EM, right? But honestly, in practice, almost no practitioner does this. Right? We should ask um, you know, so such a question. So once it, you know, this is about uh, you know, 15 years ago, we started looking at this problem, realizing that uh, you know, why do we want to cluster data? Start asking yourself some hard questions. Why do you want to cluster it? Just to fit the model? No, the, you know, the zebra fish doesn't know the model, doesn't know, doesn't even uh, Gaussian distributions. Why do they want to classify or cluster different data, right? So one thing we found very fundamental is that the, we must gain something from partitioning the data in the proper way, right? We get rewarded by doing it right. One thing, you know, very intuitively, if we put the X, Y has, indeed the data has a multi-model structure, if we put them together, we need a bigger bag. It has span a much bigger volume. But if we can partition them properly in a judicious way, then each part, the volume become much, much smaller, right? It's really become very, very fundamental idea is that, the, you know, the correct clustering should minimize the volume or the, the coordinates, right? So the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Now the question reduces to that, if I gave you a set of data points, what's the volume? How much price I have to pay to store the data, right? Here it leads to the you know, fundamentals of information theory, right? How if I have a source, what's the number of bits, average bits I need to encode my data, right? For data, it turns out there's something rather universal, uh, especially if you, it doesn't, of course, in general, we talk about a Gaussian source, but it turns out if your data in the high dimensional space is low dimensional structure, and the same rate distortion function gave a tight upper bound, very, Interesting, right? You can derive this formula from pure algebraic perspective or from a statistical point of view. Very, very interesting. You always end up with exactly the same formula. Uh, even the form, even the coefficient become the same. So now imagine now this is sort of a measure, right? So you, 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 you give me a set of data points. I can partition the data, try it out. So which partition get, uh, allows me to save, right? So, uh, so once you have equipped this, you actually can do data clustering without anything else. Right. The only thing you need to tell me is that how big the, the, the how big the ball is, right? The quantization, the rate distortion. The only thing you need to know is that how grossly or approximate the data points. Then it actually turns out, you know, it really explain why you should split data, right? If you have data like this, if you split it correctly, you save this. Or if your data has more concentrated on load, you actually this kind of sifting property, right? Can discover load dimension structure that in the middle of something else, right? Because once you partition data like this, again, the total load cleanliness will be smaller. It will compress the data better. So um, then once you have this, you actually can just, you know, we, we came up with a very, very basic algorithm, the, the, the most the stupid algorithm you can imagine, right? We just merge data points whenever they help me save this. Most greedy local operation, right? Turns out this, compression-based clustering algorithm works miraculously, right? It beats everybody, right? It actually finds global optima despite extremely robust outliers and noise. And we don't understand why until today, right? And also if you change the quantization error, it has beautiful phase transition behavior, even with this greedy algorithm, right? No guarantee of global optimality. And actually works for real data, right? Before the deep learning error, it's the, give the state of art. 
image segmentation algorithms without anything. And also the, the, the object function is purely objective. There's no subjective thing, no heuristics, no regularization, nothing, right? Just minimizing where to basically count bean counters. We just count the beans, right? The one allow gives the minimal number of beans wins out. Actually that gives the best image segmentation algorithms. But also this actually generalized to classification. Right, so once we, we know how to group data together, uh, we get a little bit bold, right? If a new data points comes in, we ask which class it belongs to, which class it belongs to. Of course, you can say, you know, statistically will tell us, you know, let's do map, right, down the distribution, let's do maximum like, we'll do our maximum like plus tier, right? But in practice, nobody does this, okay? Practitioner, nobody does this, okay? They do, instead of SVM, they all they do neural networks, right? We really should ask ourselves why at this point. Turns out, you know, we actually gone through the same process about 10 years ago, right? Turns out that the way that why, especially with low dimensional structures, none of that formulation actually makes sense, right? Maximum likelihood does not exist, right? So that's why people do SVM, do all this discriminatory problem. And turns out that there's a way to unify things, right? You only have to think about, it. you assign a point to a class, if that class can play the minimum extra bits to explain that point, to incorporate it, that's it. Now again, it's a bean counter, counting business. We're counting the beans, right? It's very parsimonious, right? Turns out this very basic, almost naive idea actually gave you the optimal classifiers when the number of samples goes to infinity. Yeah, if you're in the, in the rosy situation, you know the distribution, actually this classifier gave you the, but actually works all the regime from, from single points to all the infinity points, right? So this is actually very, very interesting about this. We actually know this about you know 15 years ago. But we sort of stopped there, right? And also this is the first classifier we actually saw really extrapolates the low dimensional structure of the data, right? You can see compared to the nearest neighbor, this is the data. I mean, the, 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 we never see data on the left-hand side, right? Yet this is the boundary of the classifier you get from the minimum coordinates. And yet, you know, SVM or with kernels that give you partition segmentation like that, a classifier boundary like that. Right. This is actually, we know at the time we are, do, the conceptual is very, very good, but there's some problem with this, right? Because the computation is actually costly. It's long parametric. It's used data to extract themselves, right? And also, um, if their data is long linear, again, we assume data are linear, right? Linear subspace, if they really need a kernel, right? So those are the things sort of, you know, we stop there. We know that we're happy with the publisher paper and we're done. Now let's that bring us to the deep learning. Now let's ask if I'm not happy with the raw data, what I can I'm allowed to do? Right? If I'm allowed to represent the data, deform the data a little bit. If the original representation is not good enough, I try to seek a parametric representation. Right? So what I want, then you really ask yourself very, very hard question. What do you, what do you really, really want? What are you allowed to do? Of course, you know, if your data is a, a long parametric, we try to give a parametric model, right? This should be compact. How we save space. Second, the data may be nonlinear structure, curves. Make, let's make it linear because it's easy for me to do interpretation and so on so forth. And also if the data are barely separable in the original space, let's try to make them discriminative, right? So that it will be a robust generalizable. That's about it, right? That's what I want. That's my wish list, right? So now you ask yourself, then, then why neural network comes around? What, what role the neural network may play or may not play at all, right? So be a little bit specific. We actually know, you know, the traditional way train neural network has problems, right? This is a Donald Hoss group notice that if you do the cross entropy or uh, fitting the labels, you see this kind of neural collapsing, right? Which means that each class, the feature converts to a one dimensional feature, which correlates to its label. It doesn't really tell you much about the data structure. Now, if we, our job of learning is to understand something about the nature of the data, right? We should, under, we, we should say something explicit about it, right? For example, for different classes, I want the, 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 they're separable, as incoherent as possible, right? And also within the class, each class, if data in the same class, I want them compressible, right? As low as possible. The volume dimension as low as possible, right? And also that I want them to be linear because it's easy, compact to use, right? 
Six, third, is actually, I do not want to have this neural collapsing issue, right? I don't want to just fit a dark label. What if the label is wrong, right? I want to understand what the structure of the data actually explain the separability, right? And I, in fact, I want to find that all features of each class set, can separate, distinguish itself from other classes. I want the feature to be diverse, right? Now the question is, this is maybe too much to wish for, right? Is there something we can actually do here? Yes, there is. So remember that now we are allowed to touch the data, right? Before we just dealing with clustering, clustering, cl compressing the data as the way they are. Now, if we uh, um, allow the freedom to deform my data a little bit to a new space Z, right? So I can measure how good it is, right? The volume, average coding lens gave me a volume. How good, it, how the data, the size, dimension and so on, right? This is, this is a very magical, a pre you, very magical expression. You should keep that log determinant. Of something, right? It shows up everywhere. Um, we didn't understand. I mean, this, before people use this as sort of a, a pro, you know, a proxy for low dimensionality, low rank, and so on. I mean, turns out this talk gives you everything, almost everything. So now, if I'm dealing with classification, clustering setting, I can partition data into multiple classes, right? Then the average, you know, don't be scared by this expression. This is just the, you know, the, the pie just to give you the membership which point belongs to which group, right? It's actually exactly the same expression of this. We only that sort out the, the number of points in each group. And if I'm allowed to partition the data correctly, then the average coding length, the average volume, right? The total volume should be much, much smaller than the total, right? This is the, the bits, the price I pay if I, I, I partition the data correctly. Right? Now you ask yourself for that wish list, really what you want to achieve? Right. I want different classes to be separate, right? To be as far into coherence as possible. I want each class to be as compressed as possible, right? I'm counting the beans. Really, you, what you're trying to do is maximize the difference, right? The whole and the, the parts, right? So therefore you can see this object function already have two parts, right? All the similar contrast, dissimilar contrast, right? You heard about contrastive learning, contrastive learning. Actually, that's just one side of the story. Right, you really want to achieve a, this object function gave you both side, right? Trade trade off. Actually, you're not trading off. Turns out, this this picture gave you the intuition what they're really doing, right? So intrinsically, if your data lies on two lines, those two models are the same, right? Intrinsically, right? There's you know the, the, it just tells you data on two lines they're separable, but we prefer the one on the left. Why? Because that one that one is more discriminative. Now. If you code the data as a whole, right? You needed a whole sphere. The whole uh, sphere gets filled with balls, right? Or if I can partition them, I only needed to pay the number of average bits is just the, how many green balls right, cover the data, right? Really the difference I'm maximizing is the space in between, right? That's how many uh, blue balls I'm counting. Again, I'm saying we're all bean counters. The whole talk is about counting beans, right? And then that's my objective. As you can see, if I can maximize this blue balls, the number of blue balls, right? The, the object function will prefer the, the, the configuration on the left. This leads to the maximum coding rate reduction principle, right? It says that I find a, I find a mapping such that the difference between the rate, rate coding rate for the total and the parts are maximized. Well, you say, well, if you're counting the beans, you say, well, I can cheat, right? I can, how about I maximize, I scale the, 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 the right-hand side by two or three, four, right? Then I got more variables, right? Of course you cry fouls. So, well, that's not fair. Why it's not fair? Because your data is not normalized. To compare two representations, the blue balls, which one is bigger? You normalize your data, right? So you either normalize based on the forbidden norm or put all the data on the sphere. Right, normalize the scale, right? So this is the, so the process you can see people in, in practice, right? People do all kinds of normalization, batch norm, layer norm, instance norm, group norms, right? We're mathematicians, right? Why do we do normalization? Because we want to compare something. Here it is, right? You compare something, that's it. I mean, and then once you realize that actually all the normalization should be equivalent, equivalent. as I like said, the scale's fair, right? So that's actually the first explanation. I should really gave you a fundamental explanation why you want to do normalization, 
and it shows up every layer. Then you can compare the representation from different networks or different layers of networks, as long as they're all normalized to the same scheme. Now the question is, does the object function give you what we want? Remember that wish list we started, right? Yes, it does. Right? Under fairly general conditions, you actually can prove this mapping, the Z, uh, reach its maximum precisely when each subspace become orthogonal. And also not only that, the, the features in each subspace become nearly isotropic, right? That's the condition, you know, that's the final configuration that data will, will, will achieve if you do the right thing. So in a sense, we add change the slogan of Aristotle a little bit, right? So we're not just wanted the whole is larger than the parts. We want the whole is maximally greater than the sum of the parts. There's some, you know, previous attempt to do similar ideas. You know, this is a, for the interest of time, I'll skip that. Um, and also in, in contrastive learning, as I said, there's a both contrast and uh, contractive part of it. But now this framework really tells you clearly what part you should contrast, what part you should be compressed, right? And also not limited to pairwise, you actually can do arbitrary uh, points. So then, then the first thing, then we have some fun, right? Um, then, you know, we, let's just keep the, uh, the, the practice of deep networks. I mean, the way that R is that, whatever your favorite network, you only need to replace the cross entropy with this rate reduction objective. Nothing, everything else is exactly the same. Data training uh, optimization, exactly the same. You don't have to do anything. But now you are actually monitoring every quantity you're monitoring, the three rates are physically statistically meaningful. You actually easily tune your algorithm whether or not the algorithms are maximizing the rates or not, without even looking at the, the, the classification error. So now we start to see something very, very striking, right? This is, the, you know, uh, compared to cross entropy, right? This is after training the features, right? This confusion map between the 10 class and the CFAT 10. This is a confusion map you get on the CFAT 10 after training with the uh, rate reduction. I mean, in my life, dealing with real data, all my life, I've never seen confusion map this clean. Okay, I'm not, I don't know about you, but this is real CIFA data, very, very messy, right? Not only that, we can see that the each class, we, we take a component, PCA of their component of each class. You can see that actually sort of spread it about a dozen of dimensions. They're not squeezed like a cross entropy, gets narrowed down to one dimension, just fits to the label. Let's visualize those uh, PCA a little bit. Let's take two classes, right? Birds and uh, uh, the, the ships. And you can see that within the subspaces, because it keeps all the diversity, we plot an image that aligns up with, uh, the closest to each of the principal components coordinates. And you can see that those images gets embedded in the subspace in a very, very well organized way, right? Each principal components actually sort the image for you. We didn't enable that, we didn't ask them to do that, but the, the, this, will get, this is the best natural embedding you get from this. And one thing realizing since we are not fitting the darn label, right? We are actually compressed data as a set. So if the labels are wrong, fine. The algorithm will only compress what is compressible, right? Identify the subspace. You can see that as a side effect is that the nice benefit is that, you know, you can have 10 all the way up to 50% of labels arbitrarily corrupted, right? But the MCR to degrade very gracefully because it's no longer trying to actively fit all the labels. Right? This is one benefit. Also, this all works for soft supervised learning. I'll skip that for the interest of time. And I, by the way, just this same darn, darn object without any heuristics, right? Give you a state of our soft supervised learning on, on those data sets. The, the next best, you can check. They use 10 different heuristics, okay? And also they have to train again, okay? We don't do any of that. Just on the raw data, do the compression or not. But you beat everybody. Are we happy? No, we're not, right? We here, we only just to replace, right? We still borrow ResNet, we still borrow neural networks, right? But there's nobody tells me, why, why should I use a layer network, right? It's still back box. Yes, the object function become more meaningful. Even the feature, arguably, you learned is more meaningful, geometrically, statistically, right? We can argue that, but but the whole dark process is still black box, right? The mapping is still black box. Why do we even need a layered architecture, right? Why not is a graph? Why is it not some weird, you know, that uh, or random projection, right? So, and what's the role of this linear nonlinear operator in that, right? 
And wh wh why also multi convolution? Right? People are you know, convolution shows about uh, for invariance. Then why multi channel? Right? Why all these particular structures? Can we open the box to that white? Right? Make the white box. The good thing with having an ultimate object function is that you couldn't care, right? If this is something you set out to do, then maybe well, as well, we just directly do it, right? Uh, if the deep network shows up along the way, that's so be it. If it doesn't, great, we have a better way of doing things, right? So this is actually something we, we stare at this object function, we start realizing, okay, well, we try to, 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 to find Z such that the maximizes object function, then why can't we just optimize it directly, right? So that's just a nonlinear optimization problem, how hard that could be, right? Let's just take the, the simplest to crack at it. Let's do a greedy descent, everybody's favorite, right? But we're not training neural networks. We're actually optimizing the object function we wanted in the first place, all right? So let's do a, a, a greedy descent on this object function. And again, why it's projected? Because we have to normalize, right? That data gets normalized sphere. And which normalization actually really doesn't really matter as long as the same scale, the, every layer or every network using the same normalization scheme, as long as they can compare, okay, that's it. And once you start taking the gradient of this object function, something magic happens, right? I didn't know this. Right? So you take the gradient of the first term. Remember the two terms, right? This is a expanding term. This is compression term, right? The first term has this. The second term becomes this, right? So anyone is, have you know statistical background recognize what exactly what this is. Right? When I first saw this, I was actually quite surprised. I never actually bothered to do this, but you know. So you really see that this has this structure, this matrix hit the data, right? And also in, this, in the second term, it's just a sum of those, this, this matrix hits the data, right? What is those matrix? They have precise statistical and geometric meaning. They are precisely the residual of using the data as regressor to regress each other. It's called autoregression, right? And by the way, it's a residual of the regression. So I'm actually quite surprised people come up with, you know, I mean, they come up with this rest network, right? And here is exactly residual, your computing, right? And also keep in mind, zebra fish doesn't know, right? Uh, anything, all they have, the animal have is the data themselves, the observation they have. They can only use data to model data, okay? So this actually exactly says that. You use the data to regress other data and the residual tells you how good each data point gets explained by other data, right? And then the residual tells you if I, this is the how differ you from other data points. If I need expansion, I just expand them in those directions. If I want to compress, then I just reduce those residuals. That's exactly the, full, the, the, the form, right? If I want expansion, that's a positive. I magnify those residuals. If I want to compress those class against each class, I, I, I reduce those residuals. So now, really what you realize in that, do the gradient descent on Z, right? You only have to compute those two things, right? You can push the data point up, around to reduce the, 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 the rate reduction. The only, there's only one problem, right? You, here in the second term, in order to compute the, 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 the gradient, you needed to know the membership, which point belongs to which, because that's a cluster, right? We only use points from each class. But for a new point in the space, Right? You don't know. You don't know that. But, but you know that the CZ, this term is that, what? It's exactly the residual. Remember the minimal incremental coordinates principle, right? That's a residual. Then just assign it to the closest class. It's already computed for you, you know. All you have to do is just do a soft mask, right? Or any, any your choice of assignment. I mean, because you don't have to be precise here. We're just all doing a process of greedy descent, right? So what is a little bit wrong? Don't worry, just push the data, right? We're just make the configuration a little bit better. That's it. As long as it's sort of generally in the right direction, you're done, right? And by the way, if as long as you know what you're approximating, actually this residual, you can actually just approximate by, if you force all your features to be positive on the, on the first quadrant, actually you can re re replace approximate that residual just by the relative. Okay, it's just a choice. Now, once you write this down, the object, uh, uh, the, the optimization algorithm, right? The, the next iteration is just the, the previous iteration plus the gradient descent, learning rate, and, the, and those operators. You just plot the diagram. What do you get? You get a deep network, right? 
and the nonlinear, and there are two nonlinear. One is the routing assignment, soft assignment. The other one is the normalization, automatically arise for you. And there's something you probably, uh, something really, really strange now, right? You don't need to train the network. The whole network is constructed forward fashion. All the operators C and E are constructed from the data in the previous situation, right? All you need is the data from the previous output from the previous data to construct a value of all the linear operator and the nonlinear operator. You don't need anything else. It's a fully, fully con uh, forward constructed, right? And uh, by the way, and you can compare, compare, right? The meta structure of ResNet or after ResNet, there's a ResLex, right? People find uh, adding some parallel channel helps. Well, here's the reason why, right? Actually, Google takes things to extreme, right? I mean, that's the most recent uh, switch transformer. Take 1.7 trillion parameters, right? It has exactly the same meta structure as ResNet, Redwood Network. The, of course, they call them experts, right? Parallel experts, 5,000 of them, 4,000 of those, right? And they're Google, they can do that. But they, they train everything, they initialize everything from scratch in the train, right? With thousands of millions of uh, GPUs. Right? By the way, even the routing algorithm, uh, even the routing function is exactly softmax. It has exactly the same form as we, as we derive. Okay, but they, they, they got it from trying, right? So this thing actually starts working. Do you ask them why this, does this work? Yes, it does. Uh, you can see this is the different class of Gaussian. We just do some baby toy example, right? Start with this. And you can see that we can now, do, my students have some fun. This is April Fourth day, right? Um, you can build a 2000 because the deeper is better, the wider is better, let's just do deep, right? We can do 2000 layers, right? We don't have to worry about it, everything converge, right? You have to worry about the, you know, the, the regularize everything. It's just an optimization algorithm. Everything goes forward, right? You can see in the end, they just uh, split, you know, push the data into three or so directions, right? Of course, it, it converged after a hundred iterations. What else, right? So you, of course, in, 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 this is just for vectorized data. What about if we wanted our data to be variant, right? Translation, rotation, that's at least those two basic, right? We want our features to be variant or equivariant to those. And by the way, you know, people, of course, let's do some augmentation, let's add data into it, uh, you know, do supervision. By the way, even after all that effort, the, the, the modern highly trained DNN are not, right? environment, even to simple transformation, according to recent studies at all. Even small deformation can throw things, things apart, right? Mathematically, really what we're trying to do, right? You ask yourself the question, you know, I want the, all my transformed data mapped to the same subspace. Okay, that's it. I don't know how to do it, but that's the goal, right? That's my wish list. You really want to do that, right? Now you ask yourself then, well, if that's the goal, let's just do it, right? Let's put all the equivalent uh, samples, right? Into my data sets. Let's compress them together, right? Group them together. Well, let's I'll use the one dimensional data to, as example, I'll take all this translational, um, uh, the, the, the shifting, right? The cyclic shifting, right? You get the cyclic matrix of this form, right? Basically each column is the data you want to compress together, right? They're all to become uh, augmented samples. Then you ask yourself, what will happen, right, with those operators? Once you augment all the data with their circular version, what will happen to those operators, E and C channels? They become auto auto convolution automatically. You don't have to choose automation or uh, convolution. You don't have to choose which one. The data will tell you if you want to compress all of together, you better use a convolution, right? You derive it, not only the form, but also the value. The same with C channel. Now we start to realizing a fundamental problem that nobody studied it. So yes, we want environments. We actually turned out want too much, right? We want the environments. Also, we want the linear subspace structure. That signal can be superposed to each other, right? Turns out you cannot want you cannot have both, right? For example, if your data if your data has even have a single uh, delta function. If you allow to translate everywhere and then allow arbitrary superposition, these guys can generate anything, right? So hence, there's a fundamental trade-off between invariance and separability, 
how can you ensure your data apple can be separated from oranges? You have to assume your data are sparsely generated. You cannot allow arbitrary superposition. Okay, this is where sparse repetition comes into the play in a very fundamental way. Right? So for example, your data only sparse generated from some dictionary. Then you want to find the sparse code first before you can separate them right? in, this, in, this, in this sparse code space. Of course, one simple way to compute the sparse code or even approximate it, let me just do, do a last filter, right? Hit with some random filters or something, right? Lift the data into higher dimensional spaces with random projections. Once you do that, now you've, you try to group all the translated shifted environment features together, right? Then something interesting happens, right? With all this block circular features, lifted features, multi-channel features, the operator automatically become multi-channel convolution, right? They're not separated. You know, the C channels you lift it with, hit with, they start with every layer will talk to each other. So actually that's the get this structure automatically from derived from the principle. And also the EC matrix is not a generic matrix. By the way, right? It's n-dimensional vector and also C channels. That's n times C. But then the, the matrix is n C by n C, right? Then to inverse such a matrix, we know it's cubic, right? No, actually it's not. The, the, the E and C matrix has very good structure, block circular structures. So the matrix actually, you, we know circular matrix we can diagonalize with four buildings, uh, with, with a Fourier transform, right? Hence, this matrix E matrix actually is a diagonal block matrix. To invert it. In this frequency domain, the cost is C, the cubic in channel and the linear in number of pixels, right? So this is the first time I realized in that, right? This is actually a fundamental difference between doing things in the spectral domain and in, this, in the original space, rather than just convenience, right? Precise to compute operator of this form, doing it in a frequency domain. That's why actually in, in nature, right? I will maybe just explain why our brain, visual cortex, those, those neurons actually compute in spikes, in the rates of spikes, not magnitude, right? And also what would this give us, right? Keep in mind that, you know, that in the convolution, you say, oh, of course people actually, you know, we, we know how to, we, know we, we should use the convolutions, right? Use wavelets, make things invariant and equivariant. Uh, we modulize, we can even prove by um, this will environment. But why do you need all the filters, right? If I only learn a network to separate oranges from apple, I don't need to pay a price for a filter that works for on pineapples, okay? So this is actually very different, we realize it, right? This network is completely adapted to the data. Hence the channel number stays constant because I only care about this data, I only care about the 10 classes, right? Yet, if you want to build your network from wavelets, you have to preemptively strike all possible signals. Right, then you have to use the complete basis at every layer. Then that explodes, right? That's why you can only build two or three layers. And so for the first time, all right, I mean, you can actually write down, uh, you know, just from the rate reduction object function, write down a white box deep convolution neural networks by construction, layer by layer, in a forward, purely forward fashion. Every parameter is computed for you. You don't get to choose the structure. You don't get to choose the convolution. You don't get to choose the value. Right? And there is an advantage to do this in the spectral domain. You can write it down after four transform. So finally, we start getting a hold, a little bit of hold of this elephant, right? You have a multi-class signals, you wanna separate them. Well, you wanna also evariance, right? So there's a trade-off between sparsity and evariance. Hence, you lift, you compute the sparse representation in certain higher dimensional spaces, get the sparse codes, and then as long well as the different classes, those codes are generally separable, it doesn't matter if they're nonlinear or linear, then the rest of the radio network will do the work for you. We'll map that configuration to a very standard configuration, a set of subspaces that are orthogonal to each other. Great. Every component in this network come as a necessary condition, right? Sparse code is for separability. Otherwise you cannot hope evariance and separability at the same time. A deep network is just to maximize the rate, right? Deform the data. To maximize it. A special computing is just a for shift variant for, for economy, for efficiency. You can, of course, you can do it. Then you have to invert the generic matrix. You know, you get a cubic complexity versus an integer complexity. 
convolution, normalization, and linearity. Everything arises in a natural way, and you don't get to choose them. Okay. So does this work? This does, right? So you can actually run. So now we no longer, by the way, we're not no longer just augment the data with some rotation, five or 10 of your choice. Let's add them, then we just add them a little bit more. No, you don't do that, right? Here we actually, the network's constructed for all translation, every degree. And it actually turns out, you actually you can separate, right? You get from the original data to the final data. You get confusion map very, very clean. The subspace are exactly orthogonal to each other. And of course, generalized to 10 classes and so on and so forth. Translation is the same story. Now we don't just worry about a few translation, we worry about translation every pixel on the entire torus. We want to separate those two sets of data. Is that doable? Yes, you can, right? As long as do the right thing, right? And no longer, you know, we'll, we'll give guarantee true events. Right, so you can see it's the same phenomena. For 10 classes, two classes, uh, you get the same phenomena with translation, 2D translation. Uh, by the way, we get into the same network, you know, see, there's no point you, you, you cannot back propagate, right? I mean, to see, you know, I can still fine tuning if I take a 30 layer, if the 30 layer is not good enough, let's just fine tune them, right? I still have the label, I can still do back propagation, right? To fine tune networks. Of course, you see improvement from 93 to 94, right? 97, get a few points. Right. And by the way, the network, network has exactly the same capacity. It can eat all the training data. You get a, get the training data to zero percent, right? It, because this is nothing different from any network we have been familiar with. ResNet, the ResNet transformer, they're the same, right? So finally, just to conclude uh, this a little bit, right? Um, and I have I want to save a few minutes for for, 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 for for discussion, right? So what do we have learned? So you starting from the clustering, right? You typically we try to cluster high dimensional data with low dimensional structures. You have to take on the low dimensionality head on. You cannot really, I beg everyone, right? You cannot beat the bushes anymore, right? Pretending you have those distributions, their general distribution at your disposals, right? Mutual information, KL divergence, all this maximum likelihood, all the things as they're well-defined and you can do analysis. No, you cannot because when practitioners it takes those, none of them is computable. All of your theory will be useless for them, okay? to be honest. Right? We already know that even for linear subspaces, okay? It's not even for large generalized, let alone you have manifold. So then, so one thing for clustering doing it correctly, using the compression, right? That's really doing compress the second term, but against the pi, right? We try to find out the membership so that the data gets most compressed. We're not deforming the data. We're just compressed data as they are. Or in the classification, right? We have a new data points. We try to really minimize the pi, right? The membership to which cluster that minimize the incremental coordinates, right? That leads to the generalized version of classifier, right? In the binal case, right? Actually it leads to exactly the map, regularized map. Now, if we are allowed to deform X to Z, right? You are about to optimize against Z as well, if I were given that freedom or that resource to do, we can do better, right? We can map those things to a standard linear subspace orthogonal to each other. That's what the Redu is doing, right? You really against the Z. Then really keep that network arise just to let's follow the gradient flow, right? That gives you the network structure, right? Hence, really that almost for all learning supervised unsupervised, right? Clustering classification is just compression. You just compress your data. I got uh, counting the beans. Which one gave you better? Which classification or uh, class, uh, clustering gave you better? Uh, less number of beans you're down, right? A principal approach to you know deep learning is just optimization. Layers of networks is doing nothing but optimize that. Try to compress your data better, right? So it's very very simple and unifying, as you realize. But then that just leads to all kinds of open problems that we didn't even realize. Uh, all my life I've never. Right. For example, I'm starting to realize that, you know, Jesus, all this, you know, clustering phenomena we observed before, right? We, we at the time, we're very pragmatic. You know, we're, we're happy with the algorithm we got, you know, segment the image pretty well, we're done. But they're now realizing there's something really magical about this optic function, right? The phase transition and the, or even the robustness of MCR, there's no analysis. There's no theoretical guarantee. Why should it be that way? Why should it work that well, right? 
And also, what about we talk about the subspace? What about the other conditions, right? The other configurations. We talk about subspace or Gaussian. What about you know other distribution, Laplacian? When they achieve rate reduction, right? Well, the principle, you know, you can, as long as you know how to compute the rate of distortion, then you can do this for any distribution as well, right? But I would have no idea what the, the optimal conditions for those distributions are. And also there's, we start to realize that there's a fundamental trade-off between sparsity and invariance, right? So I, I just finished writing a five, 700 page books about the sparsity. I start to realize and John and I was realizing there's a one problem we never talked about, right? Looking at sparse representation in the ensemble way. Right. We always care about, hey, let's find the sparse representation to approximate as each given signal up to epsilon, right? No, we don't care about that. In classification clustering, we care about for the entire set of images, apples or oranges, uh, do you have a reasonably good sparse representation that make them separable? There's no quantitative theory or even qualitative theory on that. Right. It's quite, quite interesting. But what is the trade-off? We don't know, by the way. But it works very well. Uh, joint optimization. The question is that if you want to do unsupervised learning, you don't have the label pi. What do you do? You do joint optimization. You get this very interesting joint dispute, a uh, joint dynamics, right? You descend on z and pi alternatively or just simultaneously. I don't know. It's up to you, right? By the way, right? People these days, you know, you may heard about the uh, self-attention transformer, right? Imagine if you don't have the pi, what do you need to do to compute the information about pi? Similarities between your data. Data auto regress themselves. That's the only way, right? Compute the similarity. Look the, what the self attention is doing. Okay? It's exactly the inner product between the samples. They're computing information about a pi. Okay? Nothing else. Right? That's it. Right? Mystery solved, right? Despite the Google keep, keep giving different names to, 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 to do whatever they do, right? No, it's just a similarity, inner product, right? And also the other thing that leads to all kinds of interesting things, but the, the, so far the Redu network is very, very basic vanilla, by the way, right? I mean, you can, you know, what about the convolution? The, the convolution, we, remember, we also EAC has those structures, right? A block circular, we just talk about it, but there's a lot of relationship between E and C as well. There's a lot of redundancy, and also they themselves could be separable or short. Right, support can be so under what condition of your data, those E and C channels can have additional structure, we don't know, it's up to you. And also that, of course, once you realize in the layers, just doing optimization, then all the tricks we have learned about optimization can come to play, right? I can do acceleration. Then I introduce skip connections, right? Between cross layers. That's what exactly less trough acceleration method does. All the tricks about optimization, acceleration, ADMM, uh, augmented Lagrangian, everything goes, right? You can actually modify your network, make it more efficient, make it more customized to different settings. So for rotation translation works very well. What about other groups? We don't know. And how to combine them, I don't know, right? But people keep to talk about neural tangent kernels, kernels about, well, here's your kernel, right? Turns out this expression is very magical to compute the same value. You only need to know the inner product between your data. Well, that's for linear subspace or Gaussian. If they're not, introduce a kernel, right? Another kernel, whatever you learn or whatever you prefer by choice, by design, right? To take into account some nonlinearity of the distribution. That's it, right? How to optimize pi? You know, actually some of my students are working on this, but anyway, um, as you can imagine, there's actually, uh, after we publish our paper, um, uh, there's actually, I, I got a quite a, f a lot of emails from the neuroscientists, all right? Because um, I don't know what they were doing, but um, they start to saying that they really like, uh, you know, for example, you know, we know why visual cortex do sparse reputation, right? That's one problem. And also, that, this sort of gave explanation why neurons computing spikes, right? There's a computational advantage, clear and white, black and white advantage of doing that. And also, there's also recent work that uh, primates remember faces. They encode faces as a subspace, about a 200 cells in the infernal, infernal ten, uh, temporal uh, cortex region of them, right? And they actually do interpretation. Those cells are not the remember prototypes, not the memories. They actually are the basis of, uh, of the face space. And their superposition actually can encode different faces, very clear different faces. So this is actually very, very interesting, meaning that this kind of representation can potentially be, 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 be used in the generative mode, right? Remember, this is that this model is that all the equivariant thing gets embedded in subspaces, 
right? But we don't use that for classification, but potentially they can be used for these generative models. And you don't collapse, right? That subspace spans the very biggest as it was, and also you very, very isometric. So it's actually very, very interesting to, 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 to see. And this is actually, you know, uh, the, sort of this journey we took uh, in the past year or so, right? You start to really kind of like realize, and, you know, there's something, you know, about uh, from the compression perspective to look at uh, data clustering, classification, and the representation, right? How they nicely fit each other and following the same principle of compression, looking for compact linear representation of your data. If your data is nonlinear, allows you to deform that, to make them linear. That's what deep networks is doing, right? So this is actually the, 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 the two related uh, nearest workshop. Actually, we submitted to ICML and the review is pretty good. We'll see what happens, but uh, you can see the archive version online. And also, of course, there's a sort of big book. We, it's, the book is about a low-dimensional model and sparse low rank models, but the last chapter actually we gave a little bit you know, connection to see how the things really fundamental, deep networks are really strive for learn low-dimensional structures models in high-dimensional data, nothing else, okay? And linearize them. So there's also, yeah, just for the interesting, you know, we, we my student is taking an effort to try to make all the code as nice as possible for, so there's a GitHub link uh, with the, there's a demo. I mean, you can play. Um, the good thing with Red Room Network is everything is forward constructed, right? And also you can you can actually construct your network even if you have a one sample per class. Okay. And it's guaranteed, right? The principle, every component, what it does, you know what it is. And it's white box and you also vectorized variable version or convolution version. Uh, we actually try to share. And this, this GitHub, this, 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 this code base will grow, right? There's many, many different versions. Um, different varieties, and we are making things much more efficient. Right? The current implementation is a little bit of sound because you know everything is basic, but you know this we are barely started with with, with making things uh, much more efficient. So finally, I mean, if you forgot about everything I said, just remember this one sentence, right? A deep convolutional neural networks architectures are iterative optimization algorithm for compression. That's it. Right? It's really nothing more or less than less to it. Um, so that's my talk. Yeah. Hopefully, Excellent. I'm on time. Yeah. Uh, yep, it, it's gone well. Um, 